So in the last video, we looked at EPL and ELT. We talked about how ELT is a process of extract, load, and transform. And the extraction and the load um, is extracting from one data source and loading into your data warehouse. A lot of times when your data gets loaded into your data warehouse, it's not easy to query. It's not a single source of truth. It's not easy to discover or, or consume from a, uh, an analytics standpoint. And so what we do is we transform the data once it's in our data warehouse, and that's the last, that's the last step. So the, the goal of the transformation step is to create analytics tables for humans, to create a single source of truth. It's easy to query, easy to discover, and we hope that's also maintainable. So here we have a raw database, and this is the database that we've loaded our data into after it's been extracted from its original source. If we look at these tables, we have just two tables, inventory and order item. If we look at inventory, we'll see we have a gen date, which is actually a timestamp. And we'll see that we have this ID site X, and ID site X is the ID warehouse. And we want to make this a little bit more easy to consume. So we'll do some renaming, and we'll cast our timestamp as a date. Finally, we'll create a schema called analytics, and we'll create a table in the analytics database called inventory. And you can see we've already started adding value here. Because we have that gen date, we can group by day and look at the quantities. So now let's say someone comes to us and says, you know, I really like your analytics warehouse, but I'd like to know when the items are new and when they are used. So we add a case statement in here. And again, we've added a little bit more value because we can group by gen date and also by book type. So this is starting to get really useful for our end users. We have another table called order item. This is our raw table. It actually looks pretty good, but we're gonna standardize some of these names so that they have an underscore between each of the words. And people start using this. And they realize that they'd really like to analyze order items based off of this book type field. We don't have book type in order item, but we can add it. And the way that we add it is by adding a book type from the inventory table that we just created. And you'll see here that I'm pulling from the analytics schema the inventory table. And this is great because we've defined our logic once here and we're using it, so we're not repeating ourselves. And now I can materialize that view as a table. And we're immediately getting some more value out of that. We have a used and new and different sold prices and sold tenants and revenue. So how do we productionize this? Well, uh, what we probably want to do is put it under source control and push it to a remote. We also want to automate the pushing of those scripts of our master branch to a server, and then we'll run those scripts from the server on some sort of schedule, either a cron job or a Windows task. And it's done, that's really easy. This is our script to create an analytics schema. And we could stop there, except we're gonna run into some problems as our data gets bigger and bigger. This works fine with a couple of tables, but there will be a couple problems. One of the first problems we'll have is dependencies. You'll see that our order item table in analytics depends on the inventory table from analytics. So we don't want to put the order item table before the inventory table. And we can keep that in our head for now, but if we have more tables, that becomes more difficult to manage. The second problem we run into is environments. If I want to publish this to development or QA or prod, I might have to change this schema from analytics to analytics underscore Trevor or analytics underscore QA. 
And that's not a problem. I can do that with a find and replace or um, with maybe some variables or something like that. It's not rocket science, but it's definitely something I'll have to uh, manage because I don't want to be doing all of my development in production. The third thing we're going to run into is regressions, especially as your team grows. You'll end up with th things like this. So I'm just going to create a really bad join. I'm going to cross join on two rows so that all my rows get duplicated. And it's likely that you won't see this egregious of an issue, but joining tables can be really perilous and you can end up with multiple rows when you don't intend to. So you can see in our raw data, we have 888 rows. And in our analytics schema, we have 1,776 rows. So we need a way to manage regressions, especially as our team grows. Another problem is monitoring performance. As we get more data, these tables will take a longer time to create. And we want to be able to monitor the performance over time. The way I'm going to do that is to create a schema called run log and a table in it called run log as well. And the run log table has a table name, an action, a gen timestamp, and a grid. And then before and after every run of every model, I'm going to insert into that run log table. which works really well, but it is a little bit cluttered. We now have this clutter up here and this clutter down here, and it distracts us from the actual logic of what we're trying to achieve. If I run this and select from my run log, I'll see that the inventory table was started and ended at these timestamps with this grid. So now we're back with just our two tables, inventory and order item. And as we scale and as we see that things are taking longer, we'll want to go faster. And one of the ways we can go faster is to only insert new rows into the inventory table instead of dropping and recreating it every time. So we're only inserting into the inventory table records whose gen date is after the most recent gen timestamp from analytics inventory. And this will run much faster. But the problem is that if we add a new column that has a calculated field, for example, we're going to have to run the whole entire drop and recreate again. And how does that fit into our workflow? Do we copy and paste the drop and recreate statement back in here? How do we do that? Again, it's not rocket science, but it's something we have to figure out. Problem number six is that development takes a long time. So if I'm going to have to drop and recreate this during my development cycle, it's going to have to create the table. And as a developer, I don't want to be sitting here waiting for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour while it generates. So in development, I can just do this and create a view of inventory. And that'll run much faster. It'll compile so that I, as a developer, know that the joins are correct, that there's no ambiguous columns, that the fields are all named correctly. But again, if I do this, I have to remember to undo and make sure that goes back to create table because we want a table in production. So as you can see, we're trying to progress on our goal toward creating analytic tables for humans. And we've done a good job. We've created a single source of truth with the analytics schema. We've made some of our tables e easier to query and easier to discover. But I'm concerned about this maintainable piece. How do we keep this one script from getting so large and so complex that it's no longer maintainable. All of these problems that we've been talking about and more are what DBT is designed to solve. So in the next video, we'll look at how DBT solves these problems so you don't have to.